Hello, Oscillator Sync here, and this is the long-awaited drum log from Korg. I'm fully aware that this is a release day video, so it's probably coming out at the same time as quite a few other videos on the subject of the drum log, so I'm going to try and stay in my lane and not tread on the toes of my colleagues and friends. On YouTube, so my plan for this video is to start off with a quick fire FAQ going through all of the uh, features, uh, all of the things you're likely to want to know about the drum log. And then for the rest of the video, we're going to make some beats um, to get a feel for the workflow and to get a feel, of course, for the sounds as well. Before we get started with that though, um, in the interest of transparency, Korg did send the drum log over to me early to make some videos about, but they have not asked for nor have they been given any editorial oversight as to the content of said videos. So without further ado, let's talk about the drum log. Now I know I'm not a YouTuber known for his brevity, but um, let's see how quickly we can get through this. So here comes the big info dump. Let's start by talking about the sound sources here. So uh, the drum log is a hybrid drum machine, so it has a combination of analog and digital aspects to it. The first four parts here, the bass drum, snare and toms, are the analog parts. They, uh, at the core of them, we have analog sound generation, which is kind of customized to the, the jobs that we have there. Um, on top of the analog part, uh, there's also the ability to mix in a PCM uh, transient sample to go at the start of the sound, which can help you customize the attack of that sound. Next up, there are six sample parts. Now they're um, labeled as closed hi-hat, open hi-hat, rim shot, uh, clap and then to user samples, but you can actually assign whatever you want to each of those different parts. Now, the good news is that these are stereo samples. I've loaded in a synth hit, which obviously pans from left to right, and you'll be able to hear it is indeed a stereo sample there. Um, alluding to what just happened there, of course. I uh, have loaded in my own user samples, so that is something that you can do as well. And those of you who have maybe struggled in the past with some Korg librarian software um, or uh, the, uh, uh, the the way that, for example, the Opus 6 has to connect to the librarian software, you'll be very, very happy to hear that there is no librarian software involved in this. You simply start up the drum log with, uh, I think it's a record button held down. It turns up on your computer as a, a USB drive and you can drag the samples straight on. The only thing you need to do is name the samples appropriately. They have to start with a three digit number, but other than that, you drag them on, you uh, dismount the drive and it just works, which is fantastic. Now I will just quickly mention one little grumble about the samples in terms of the way that uh, this current version of the firmware works. So on uh, this uh, channel here, uh, I've got kind of this string sample going on here. And if I set its decay to the absolute longest, that's kind of all we get. Um, now that sample is like three, four seconds long. So obviously the decay uh, is not long enough to play the entire sample and there's no way currently to kind of hold the decay open until the end of the sample even if in the parameters you set the uh, start and end to zero and 100 percent so that's a bit of a limitation at the moment to my knowledge Korg are aware that people think this is a limitation so hopefully in a further firmware update we'll be able to hold the samples open for a little bit longer the final part here is the multi-engine, uh, which um, comes preloaded with a VPM, which is uh, Korg's kind of take on FM, the um, variable phase modulation. Uh, there's a, a digital noise source, which is very flexible with filtering and saturation and bit crushing and the like. And then finally, there's a user multi-engine, which uh, is making use of that kind of log SDK that we've seen on the NTS-1, the Minilog XD and the Prolog. So um, hopefully once the drum log um, has been released, um, people will start making user oscillators to load into this particular slot here, uh, which will be uh, really good news. Uh, it comes preloaded with a uh, kind of virtual analog uh, sound made from uh, made by Sound Vibes, I believe. 
to be clear, uh, you can't have um, the phase modulation, the noise and the user algorithms all working at once. There is a single uh, multi-channel here. Um, it just so happens that you select what you're doing with it with these three buttons. So there's only one channel there. You can see from the front panel that we have quite a lot of hands-on control over the parameters of the different parts here. We have volumes all across the top and then a selection of parameters for each of the channels uh, in this matrix of knobs here. But on each of the channels, we can also go into um, some menus here to get more in-depth control over the sounds and how they're rooted, panned and that kind of thing. In terms of effects, we have send effects for delay and reverb. Uh, there's some delay and there's some uh, reverb. We also have a master effects section uh, which comes loaded with uh, effects like EQ, compressor, filter. There's a really good uh, sounding saturator on there as well. You can only load one of these master effects at once. So you do have to pick the one that you want to use for a particular beat. Uh, but importantly, each of the parts that we have here can bypass that master effects. Uh, so for example, if you want to use the compressor with sidechain, um, you can sidechain the bass drum and then have the bass drum bypass the master effects so that it is not getting squashed by the uh, compression, uh, which is really, really uh, useful. Um, good thinking there, Korg. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, effects here are also making use of the kind of log SDK that we've seen on the NTS-1 and the Minilog XD, which means that um, hopefully a number of the user-created uh, and uh, third-party effects that are out there already uh, will be compatible with the drum log. So there's going to be hopefully a whole bunch of different uh, reverbs, delays, and other um, master effects like filters and uh, choruses and, and whatever else uh, that we will have uh, available to us uh, pretty soon, I would hope. Uh, there is also an audio input uh, which can be uh, routed through the effects. Um, just a, a separate jack on the back here. Uh, the sad thing about that is that it's not a sequenceable track. So you might remember on the Elect Tribes, for example, they had an audio input, which you could then like uh, uh, gate with the uh, sequencer, which was a really, really nice thing to be able to do to create sort of rhythms within there. That's not currently possible uh, on this version of the firmware anyway. I've kind of touched on this already, but I think it's worth uh, repeating. Uh, the drum log is a stereo unit. So each of the different uh, channels have panning. They also have this kind of spread, which does like a delay offset um, effect on, on most of them. The samples are in stereo and the effects are in stereo. This is a stereo unit uh, in almost every uh, regard. Let's talk a little bit about I.O. Uh, there's a main left and right output on the back as well as a headphones output. Um, excitingly, for a lot of people, I'm sure, there are four assignable outputs on the back as well. So you can send, um, you can only send one track each to each of those outputs. Uh, and when you do and you plug that output in, it will be removed from the main. Uh, but yes, we have uh, assignable outputs um, so if you need to process uh, a kick separately or your samples separately, that is something that you can do. Hooray! Um, there is MIDI on the back with proper 5-pin DIN. I'm no snob when it comes to TRS uh, mini jack MIDI, but... Okay, no, I, I, kind of, I kind of am, and I'm really glad to see full-size uh, MIDI connections on the back. Um, uh, sadly, there's no MIDI through, however. There's only MIDI in and a MIDI out. So in terms of um, integrating this into a wider um, uh, a wider setup, either this needs to be at the start or the end of a chain of uh, clock, basically. Um, it's not the end of the world, or, or, or you get a, uh, a three box, I suppose. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind if you're looking to integrate this into your setup. There's also uh, an analog sync there, so you can use um, this to uh, clock or be clocked from, for example, the Volkers uh, or um, uh, other analog gear, modular gear, or whatever it needs to be. Uh, and as kind of previously mentioned, there is an audio input as well. We also have two USB connections on the back. Uh, there's the standard uh, kind of uh, connection that you would expect to have there to connect the drum log to your computer. Um, this will not pass audio, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't act as an audio interface. It passes MIDI and it's also uh, used for uh, sample management and firmware updates and the like. The second connection, on the other hand, rather excitingly, is uh, a connection that will allow the drum log to 
act as a USB MIDI host. So you can plug in a USB only MIDI controller or for example, uh, uh, an iPad and control uh, the drum lock that way. So for example here, I've got the Nano Control 2 here plugged in. It's just USB, it hasn't got any power. It's been powered by the drum lock as well. And I've got it set up uh, to be able to control some of the channels and uh, in this case give me control over panning uh, because that's not something that's on the front panel it's got volume there uh, so you can uh, get control of uh, stuff via usb and the midi implementation is pretty complete there are some parameters that currently are not represented as MIDI CC control, um, which I'd like to see. So things like there's a filter per part that's not currently a MIDI controllable. I'd love to see that MIDI controllable. Um, Cork, if you're listening, please. On the home straight here, uh, let's talk about the sequencer quickly. It is a 64 step sequencer. Um, the length is uh, assignable per part, uh, as is the rate and indeed uh, whether or not it's working in triplets. Uh, so you can do uh, all those polymeter tricks that I personally like a lot. There is probability and per cycle step conditions. So um, uh, you can set it so that a particular step will only fire 50% of the time, or you can set it so that that step uh, hits every third time that the cycle goes round. Um, if you are familiar with the electron workflow, that will sound pretty familiar to you. Um, I think it's safe to say that Korg are at least aware of electron. Um, so that uh, functionality is uh, is there, which is uh, great, um, especially for someone who is a, an electron fanboy like me. Uh, there's velocity per step, and that velocity can play into uh, the synthesis on the analog. Um, channels in terms of the, the sweep amounts and, and the like. Uh, we've also got ratchets uh, or repeats, uh, so you can do those um, lovely trills. Uh, you can also set those to ratchet up, ratchet down, or stay uh, uh, even as they ratchet. That's really, really cool. Great for adding complexity to your sounds. We'll be playing with that very shortly. Something that was uh, surprising but very, very gratifying to discover when I first started playing with the drum log is that every single parameter can be motion sequenced. And I don't just mean the ones uh, that are controllable by the knobs here. As you go into the menu, those parameters can be uh, motion sequenced as well. And you can record those live or you can set them by step by holding down a step. Again, if you're familiar with the Electron workflow, that will be um, very, very comfortable for you. Um, even the sample slot on the sample um, uh, parts can also be sequenced per step, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we also have uh, a looper. Uh, if you've played with any Korg sequences previously, you'll be uh, familiar with the idea of holding down a few steps and having those loop. We have it on the Volkers, we have it on the S. Uh, Q1 and the SQ64. It's a really nice performance tool in order to create uh, rolls, fills, variations, breakdowns, that kind of thing. And you have control over um, how those steps are going to be played back, whether they're going to be played back in sequence or random. Finally, we have pattern chaining. Uh, you can chain up to 16 patterns, uh, but there's no um, sort of full song mode uh, on Drumlock. Hopefully that's everything you could possibly want to know. Let me know in the comments if you have any other questions. It is definitely, definitely time to start playing with some sounds, I think. Right then, let's make a beat. So I have initialized the pattern and I'm currently in live mode, which allows me to play everything uh, live as it were and allows me to select a particular part. If you wanna select a part without playing it, we can hold down the part button here and select it without it making a sound, which is great if you are um, in the middle of a jam and you need to adjust the parameters on the go. Uh, let's uh, set our BPM to 130. Uh, let's turn the bass drum up nice and loud uh, and let's lay down a, uh, a bass drum. Let's just go forward to the floor. Let's keep it simple uh, for, the mo for the moment. So I'm gonna go into step mode here here I've got the uh, bass drum selected and I'll just pop down my four to the floor there. There we go. Good stuff. So um, let's um, let's craft this sound a little bit more. Um, so on the front panel we have controls for tune, decay, nice boominess, 
and we also have drive here. And a little goes a long way. Get pretty nasty at the top end there. Cool. Um, let's um, take a look at the extended parameters here a little bit. So um, we've got this idea of the transient on the front end here, and we can select different transients. Uh, so um, if I just cycle through them, you'll hear how it affects the sound. And so on. Quite a few here. I like the bell accent one. And the fork one. <laughs> yeah. Um, now you can adjust the uh, amount of attack we're hearing here. So if we turn the attack here down to 0%, um, we're just hearing the analog sound here. And we can um, adjust the sweep amount and the sweep time. Ooh. Make it free. Tight there. Uh, we also have this hold here, which um, holds the kick drum open for a little while. Uh, but we can turn this down if we want to get more of a attacky kind of sound, even with a longer decay. I want a little bit of hold. And maybe go back to one of the more conventional transients there. Cool. Um, we also have on most of the parts a uh, filter that we can apply here. Um, you can either have it turned off where it says through, we can high pass it in one direction and low pass it in the other direction. Maybe give it some uh, filtering with some resonance to get that kind of attack at the cutoff. The resonance incidentally will self oscillate, which is kind of cool because you can really get a lot of character into the sound. Something like that, I think. Uh, so let's uh, put a couple of incidental um, hits in there as well, like a... Uh, One of those, perhaps. Uh, but we probably don't want this one to uh, hit every single time. So, um, uh, actually, first of all, we probably don't want it to be as loud as the other ones either. So if we come into the accent page here, we can uh, change the level for each of the uh, steps. So we can cycle through the accents like this. But you can also hold down and set the accent amount or the velocity, if you like, uh, manually as well. So let's maybe accent each of these so they're full velocity. And we probably don't want this particular hit to happen every single time either. So let's uh, come into the step here and we can hold down here. This is where we have control over our uh, 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 our trigger conditions, if you like. So we can adjust the probability if we want. Like that. Uh, but I think probably with this kind of uh, sound, we probably want to set it to happen on the fourth of four. One, two, three, four. Like that. Uh, we also have the ability here to offset our hits. So if we want to make this one a little bit later, sort of humanize it a little bit. Don't think it sounds good though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll keep that sort of bang on there. 
maybe also have one here. Uh, but again, maybe we don't want this to happen um, very often, so we can maybe just use probability for that one. Cool, we've got a bit of a kick drum happening. Uh, let's move over to our snare, and we'll just keep things simple to begin with, and we'll just pop some stuff down on your 5 and 13. Again, this is just the default sound. Uh, so on the front panel, do we have control over? We have control over the attack of the uh, body of the sound. It's kind of over here ringing there. Much snappier there. We have uh, control over the tuning of the ringing. And we have um, control over the decay of the noise element. If we come into the um, uh, controls here, we can uh, change the type of noise we have here. So here we have the eight model. There's the nine model. You might be able to read between the lines and work out what they're talking about there. And we also have white noise, red noise, pink noise, blue noise, and a couple of lo-fi noises as well. Quite like that one. Um, inside here we can also control the level of the snap. So if we want to take it out altogether, we can. And we also got this tone control, which adjusts the um, wrong knob, adjusts the detuning between the two oscillators here. To get kind of different body sounds. And we then have our um, filter here as well. Let's just make it a bit darker. Give some resonance. And we'll turn down that decay a bit. Uh, so that's where you get um, some uh, ratchety things going in here as well. So we can have like a... Uh, so at the moment we've got a single hit here, uh, which doesn't sound uh, super interesting. But if we come into the accents, this is where we can set our ratchets. So we can hold down this step. it ramp up uh, and we probably also want to have that snap a little less longer there because we're kind of missing some of that sort of ramp up so we can come into motion here and uh, we can motion uh, sequence on a particular step if we want to so uh, we're on step 10 here so we can hold this down and we can maybe turn the snappy down. We probably also don't want this to happen every single time, so we'll come into the step here and we'll set our probability down, maybe like 30 something percent. We can have that one at the end there as well. Uh, maybe we'll set that one to a low prob to probability as well. And we probably also want to lower its uh, velocity. So we can also um, start thinking about sending stuff to our effects. So maybe we'll send our snare to our delay a bit. Maybe the reverb. It's a very big reverb. So um, let's um, I'm just gonna save this quickly uh, into one of the. Yeah, I'll do. Um, 
So uh, that reverb is pretty big at the moment. So the reverb delay and master effects kind of are tracks in themselves. So if we uh, select the reverb part here, we can change the reverb parameters a little bit. So let's uh... <laughs> those are all going the wrong way though. Let's go to a room. What's a bit shorter? Don't want a big, big one for this one. Cool. Okay, okay. What next? So next up, I think I want to add in some tom sounds, but I want to kind of give it that kind of uh, techno polymeter kind of vibe going on. Like maybe only one or two um, steps per pattern, but have those patterns different lengths to the kind of four floor that's going on at the moment. So let's go over to our low tom first of all. Uh, so to uh, set this up to work with polymeters, we want to make sure that these tracks are selected to work that way. So we can hit shift and 11 here and it's just says poly just on here. Oh, I've just turned on shift hold there. If you hold down shift uh, for a period of time, uh, I'll disable it now. There we go. Uh, if you hold down shift for a period of time, it turns on shift hold, which means you don't have to keep holding down shift with your other hand to uh, adjust parameters that require the shift or to um, fire things off on here. Be aware, however, that if you accidentally turn shift hold on and then hit, for example, step 16, you're going to init your track. Now, what's really important to realize is that if you hit it again, it undoes that init or undoes that clear. Um, so, um, <laughs> I didn't realize that to begin with, and I lost a, a good pattern early on when I was playing with this. Uh, so, yep, yeah, just a, a little tip there. You tap it again to turn uh, that off. So we want to come into the poly here, and um, what we now can do is select parts that we want to be polymetric. So to begin with, it's going to be just those two there, um, the high and low tom. So uh, we're on the low tom here, and to set the length of this particular um, part, we hold down part and we tap time, and that gets you into uh, the part time. If you don't hold down part, you just get the global time here, so the, the master uh, length of the tracks, which is currently 16. Uh, so yeah, if I hold down part, hit that, I can now set the length of this um, part um, pattern rather than the whole pattern. So let's maybe set it to like uh, uh, 13. Yeah, 13. I'll just choose that arbitrarily and I'll just uh, come into step mode and just pop down a step. So let's have a listen to how that now sounds. So you kind of got that kind of phasing sound going on there, which is cool. Um, Let's uh, pan that somewhere. So we'll come into its parameters here. And if we come through to the mix and root page, let's pan that off to the left a little bit. So it doesn't get lost underneath the kick. Let's mute our snare for a second. Uh, right, so in terms of the sound we're going here, I want to go for something that's quite sort of clicky. So quite short, maybe. In the uh, settings here, we have control over the attack again. We have a um, click that we can layer in here. Let's maybe take the attack out and maybe try and do it, just do it with the analog sound on its own. Cool. Um, we have uh, on here uh, control for the detune of this sound, which is going to um, there's two oscillators going on here, we can detune them. And we can also tune the overall sound. Cool.
And let's maybe use the um, the resonant filter here to uh, give us some uh, character as well. <laughs> yeah. Get that resonance up and it's going to ring a little bit. Oh, yeah. I've also got a drive here. See how that sounds. Could be cool. I think I'll leave it off so we get more of that attack. Nice. And let's do a similar thing with our um, high tom as well. Uh, so let's start by setting its uh, length here to something different again. So maybe like uh, 11 or something. And we'll just pop down a step. Okay, uh, let's uh, pan that uh, off to the side a little bit. Cool, uh, let's turn its decay down a bit so it's not ringing a bit much. Maybe let's do that same trick with the uh, resonant filter, give it some sort of length by pinging the filter. Let's maybe put a ratchet for this one as well. So maybe you come over here, uh, set a ratchet for this one. A bit quieter. Uh, maybe not every time, lower that, right, that probability. Put the snare back in. much uh, reverb on that snare probably. Let's just take that down a little bit. Maybe get some delay on that higher uh, tom. So at the moment the delay is uh, kind of working in mono I think. Let's set it to uh, some dotted eights and set it to ping pong. Get a bit of a filter in there. This is starting to, to feel pretty interesting. Uh, let's see what else we can do. I think this would be an opportune moment to take a look at the master effects a little bit. So um, let's come into the uh, master channel here. Um, so we can select through a number of different um, uh, effect types, including bypass. So we have a compressor, we have a filter, we have what's called the boost which is my favorite, <laughs> this is probably what I'm gonna end up using. And we also have this EQ3, which is a three band EQ. So let's just um, set that little pack going again. Uh, so uh, here's the EQ3, so we have, you know, a three band EQ. And on the second page here, we can change uh, where the uh, kind of the, the crossovers for the EQs happen. So if we want our lowest, lows to be lower and a high speed higher. We can certainly do that. Uh, so you've got EQ there, which is a uh, master EQ. And again, we can uh, bypass uh, the master effects if we don't want any particular part to go in there. So if we come into a particular part, uh, so we didn't want the kick drum to go through here, we could come uh, through to this page and we can say master uh, bypass. 
you can kind of hear that kick drums bottom end is kind of drops out now and it's going back through um so uh, that's the eq3 which is uh nice um sounds kind of lame without it now doesn't it uh so we have a compressor Uh, like uh, that. Um, so um, that's compressing everything all at once. As I mentioned, we can do side chaining. So if I turn the side chain on here, um, at the moment the side chain uh, isn't getting anything. So we're not sending anything into the side chain. So the way we'd probably want to set this up would be to come into your bass drum part here. And if we come into uh, uh, the mix and routing page here. Um, so um, the first thing we're going to want to do is turn up the side chain amount for the kick drum. So now you can hear that that compressor is really hitting down on everything. Uh, but we can um, turn the kick drum, uh, or rather take the kick drum out of the master. And now our kick drum is side chaining um, everything else. I haven't particularly set up the um, settings. But yeah, we can certainly side chain against the kick drum, for example. Uh, let me just put um, this back to where it was. Let's turn the side chain down. Uh, so uh, the next effect that we have in here uh, is uh, the filter. So this is a master filter across the whole mix, unless you take stuff out, of course. Um, so uh, again, this might be a situation where you want to take the uh, the kick drum out, or uh, you want to take the snare out, or whatever it happens to be. But we have a, basically a bunch of different um, uh, filter types here: low pass filters, band pass filters, high pass filters, and the like. We can, of course, change the cutoffs, the resonance. This one doesn't resonate quite as hard. Uh, this um, cutoff uh, is actually controllable by an external uh, controller. So this is a situation where you could sort of set up a DJ filter kind of setup um, and have that on a uh, slider, including switching to the mode, which isn't um, filtering anything. So that's pretty neat. Uh, the final one, however, is the final one? Yeah, the final one, which is my favourite, which is this boost one. And so this is kind of like a um, saturator with a uh, filter built in. Um, I'll show you what I mean. So, so we've started to get some nice boost and saturation there. But then we have this center and width control, which is essentially like a, 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 a EQ control with a Q. And we can sort of center the um, distortion around a different area. And the wider the width, the more it's going to get distorted. This is such a great way to get dirty, vibey sounds. Especially love it, sort of hitting the lower end a bit more. You can hear here that the reverb is going through the, um, the master, but you can, I believe, if you wanted to. Yeah, send it post the master if you wanted to. I just like dirty stuff, so you don't have to be quite as extreme as that if you don't want to, of course. But yeah, 
Uh, that's my favourite, I have to admit. Um, yeah. So I'm probably going to stick with that one. Right, a couple of things that uh, now we've got to this sort of mastering uh, stage that I want to just adjust before we start bringing in some of the other parts. So the first thing is um, I uh, think that my snare is currently a bit too um, a bit too bright with everything else. Now we've got a bit sort of grungier and, and lo-fi. So I think I'm going to uh, just come into its parameters here and just bring that cutoff down a bit. Might try a different reverb sound as well. Okay, that's cool. Right, let's get that uh, that offbeat uh, uh, symbol thing going on there. So let's um, still too much uh, reverb, isn't it? <laughs> So let's uh, come over to, let's get that, that offbeat um, hi-hat in there. Uh, we can record this one uh, live, I guess. So let's hit uh, the record button. Uh, let's bring uh, that down a little bit. And I'm not sure about that sample. So let's choose a different sample. Uh, so, uh, so we have samples which are arranged in uh, banks, and then we can choose the sample from there. Like a tambourine? Do you like a tambourine? Yeah. So we have control over the uh, tuning of all of our samples. Hmm. Quite like that. We can also change the start and end points uh, for the samples. Uh, we have our filter the same way we have with, with our other channels, which still can be set to kind of resonate. Yeah. Groovy. Uh, we then have a bit reduction. If we wanted, I don't think it's appropriate on this one. And a drive. Don't think we need it. Not this time. Let's pan it a bit. So we also have this spread control here, which creates like a, a, a stereo uh, delay between the two. Uh, which can kind of give you that stereo widening without sort of um, doing anything else, which is, which is neat. Um, don't think we need it for this sound, or do we? I don't know. I don't know, that's kind of cool with just a little bit of it, and then we can kind of just turn it down a bit. Delay. Just a tiny bit. And then we'll have like a polymetric thing with the uh, with the close hatch, like. Kind of thing going on. 
yeah, let's try that. Let's just save this quickly. Save the kit as well. Um, yeah, so let's uh, go into our polymeter. Let's put our closed hi-hat in the polymeter pool. Uh, come over to our closed hi-hat and let's set its length to uh, seven, I think is what is in my head. And come into the steps here. That's exactly what I had in my head, perfect. Uh, great. Um, Of ramp those up a little bit as well. So we're coming to our accent here. And just sort of have these uh, ramp up a little bit each time. Maybe we could have one that ratchets as well. But not every time. Yes. Cool, come back into the steps to set the probabilities of that to be pretty low. What do we need to do about the sound here? Do we need to just maybe darken it a tiny bit? Bring that resonance up to emphasize the cutoff. Redux? Don't know. Uh, we could also choose a different um, uh, sample, of course. That brush one's pretty cool. Cool, yeah, okay. Like that. Uh, let's play with the uh, loop a little bit now that we've kind of got into this kind of... So with the uh, loop mode, uh, we go into loop mode and we hold down a number of steps and they're just going to loop round and round and round. The way it's set up currently with the resume set to be synced, it's always going to start back in the right place. So we're not going to like um, mess up the groove. And this can be as simple as just holding down a single um, step. You'll notice there that our probability is still in play when we're holding down a single step. We also change the speed that we loop around. Cool. Uh, we'll make it faster. <laughs> or much faster. <laughs> uh, good fun. Um, we can also change it uh, to be random rather than uh, looping round forward. which is going to give you kind of different effects depending on. Uh, depending on what, what the, the beat is. And we can also set this to um, actually um, hold down. And then when you take the last one out, it goes back to playing back. Um, I per personally prefer it in momentary. Okay, um, let's maybe put some uh, samples down. So let's pop a sample down. Um, so if I come over to this sample track here and we can choose, let's I'll grab, grab one of my samples perhaps, uh, maybe just that uh, little. Yeah, let's just grab that panning synth. It's got some nice stereo movement built into it, uh, which is Good. Uh, so let's uh, get that playing. Maybe let's um, just mute a couple of. Um, I 
maybe just something like that. Hit record. Yeah, that's something in it. Um, so let's have a look at how we can mess with this sample a little bit. So we have um, controls for the attack and decay. Probably for the, by the nature of this sample, we probably want to keep things pretty open. Um, we then have our um, standard sort of filtery stuff here as well. And let's see what we can do here. Um, let's try the Redux. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay. Yes. There's something something good there. So the cutoff is before the drive, so you can't really take the high end off the drive. So we might just have to compensate with some volume there. Yep. Let's see if we can get some resonance in there. Let's see if we can change the character. Not so much. There's so much bit reduction there. Can't really get anything done there, but that's okay. Probably want to get some of that in the reverb. I think we need it. Right. Right. So um, um, on step 12, we've got this uh, second step. We want to motion sequence the tuning of that to get that other note happening. Uh, so unfortunately, we're going to be uh, tuning um, just based on tuning. Um, we'll just have to get it to the right point. Yep, that's what we wanted. We don't want that every single time. We probably want that every. Yeah, every fourth, right? So we can come into the alternate alternating one here. Cool, uh, turn that down a little bit, a bit loud. Nice. I want to get a bit of chaos into this with the uh, other sample perhaps. Um, so we come back into live mode here. And we've got... Um, got like a symbol sample going on in there at the moment. <laughs> Something like that might be fun. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, so it's that kind of pattern. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go into the motion control. Um, and it's nine, twelve, and fifteen. We want to change the sample slot on. So uh, to do that, we come into the motion here, and we just make sure that we're on the right uh, setup here um, for what we want to uh, parameter lock. And we can just hold down and. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we can also uh, set the tuning on a first step as well. Uh, we probably don't want that every single time, do we? Uh, so we want to come into the steps here and maybe set these again to like just on the. Good stuff. Cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm incredibly, <laughs> for some reason, very, very tickled by that. Let's give that uh, some shape a little bit. With some filtering. You've got to remember that filter plus resonance you can actually be used to boost the high end as well as uh, cut it. down a bit. Maybe pan it. So again, uh, to do the panning, we just need to make sure we're in the right page here, uh, which is this one. And then we can just, um, whoops into the motion sequencing. And maybe we want like loads of reverb on the R here. Cool, okay. So we've got filters, we, uh, sorry, we've got samples, we've got the uh, analog. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the multi engine just to finish this off. So as I mentioned towards the beginning of the video, uh, we have this multi section here, which allows us to choose between a couple of different um, uh, oscillator types, if you like. Um, we can only have one of these active at once. So let's take a listen to what kind of sounds we get from the multi engine. So this is the VPM, which is kind of the FM side of things. Now, uh, the multi section um, for the VPM and the uh, user is the only section where we actually talk about notes. So um, we can sort of program in particular notes when we motion sequence rather than just try and deal with the tuning, which is pretty uh, interesting. So um, here we have um, uh, basically a, a little uh, two op FM synth. So uh, ratio is the ratio between the two operators. Index is the modulation amount. Like so. And then uh, noise allows us to um, noise modulate the operator as well. So we can get kind of noisy hits in here as well. we mix that in with like a higher ratio we get some pretty uh, intense um, sounds there. We then have a um, an envelope uh, which we can then use to modulate the index or the operator amount. So maybe if I bring this down a little bit and we turn the index mod up we can hear we can kind of get that cool kind of hit sound. We can womp it in as well if we turn up the attack. Uh, and that's basically it in terms of the controls you've got here, but it's actually quite a nice way to get a range of kind of, especially percussive FME sounds. Um, we can also change the EG amount to actually hold things. Uh, we can also set the, the EG to gate, which means that uh, we can have it affect the index, but not the volume. Uh, 
I like it as AR though, to get those kind of knocks and cracks. Can get those nice FM tom sounds. What's missing uh, for me from this is that there's no way to detune um, the other operators, so you can't get those really metallic sounds so easily. You can kind of get them by going with the um, uh, other um, uh, higher ratio amounts, but still, um, it would be great to be able to um, get more sort of metallic sounds. And then after that, we have our normal controls for sending it to the reverb uh, and the like. So that's the VPM. Um, it's a nice thing to have. I quite like it for percussive sounds, although you can, as I say, use it to sequence it like a synth. Uh, so the next one along here is the noise, uh, which is a digital noise source, which has a, um, a filter built in or a decimator built in. So uh, if, for example, if we go to the bandpass here, we've got the color control, which allows us to adjust the cutoff. We have the peak, which is our resonance here. We then have an attack and release here, um, which um, just affects the um, the volume, not the cutoff. But it's good for getting those kind of uh, windy hits. And we could motion sequence the color here to get uh, pitches in as well. And we also got the decimator here, which gives you kind of that decimated sound. And the color here reduces the bit depth instead, uh, sample rate even. Uh, good stuff. So the last um, mode here is the user. Um, by default, that gives us um, nothing because uh, we haven't loaded a uh, user oscillator. Um, it comes uh, from the factory with this one called Nano, which is kind of a uh, virtual analog type thing. So we can use it to create bass lines or lead lines or, or whatever we want to do. Um, when we come to the uh, user uh, oscillators here, whatever is presented here is going to be per um, oscillator essentially. So um, in this case, uh, we've got uh, a way to choose which waves we're using, the detuning between them, the balance between them, uh, yep we've got a filter with key tracking uh, and resonance of course, different filter modes there and then we have um, control over the uh, uh, the uh, envelope generator whether we wanted to have, have an attack or not and uh, what it's going to control <laughs> um, and then we also have an LFO here as well so we've kind of got like a kind of uh, a pretty comprehensive sort of comprehensive but basic virtual analog uh, setup here, uh, which is uh, a really nice thing to have. So we could set up a something like that. And we could uh, lay that in with our uh, beat, perhaps. So, um, maybe change. So we could uh, come into our motion sequencing here. Uh, 
So um, the uh, user, uh, the multi-engines, I should say, are the only ones which will allow you to create sustained notes instead. So if we have a look here in the step here, we have a length here, which we don't have for any of the other ones. Personally, I think there should be a length for the uh, samples as well, but uh, so it goes. Um, so uh, we can choose now to uh, set the notes to these else. change the uh, probability of some of these as well so I think this one's probably uh, a every other and this one's every fourth again now, of course we could do this with longer pattern lengths but I'm so invested in the electron way of working that I end up doing it all as well I like that. That was a mistake, but I like it. So we can kind of build up, getting on for like a, a full groove here with various different parts. Um, let's go back into that master and see what else we can uh, just do um, in terms of dirtying things up a little bit. <laughs> and of course we can sort of bring things in and out with our mutes as well so we haven't got our toms in anymore And yeah, it's it's just a good, fun, performable uh, <laughs> nice, fun, performable drum machine. You know, it it, it very much sits within the the. the the uh, ethos of the of the, the log series, I think, um, it's a nice addition. So I don't tend to uh, do reviews on this channel, and this is very much a demo, and not a, a, a review. Um, but I I think it probably is worth just talking a little bit about. Um, what I think is good about the drum log and where it sits within the pantheon of other modern drum machines. The first thing I'll say is that it really feels like the drum log has a particular character to it. I have a particular preference towards sort of slightly more gritty, dirty, lo-fi sounds anyway, and it feels like the drum log likes those kinds of sounds as well. Um, that's not to say that it's it can't sound more refined. Like I, I intentionally went for a more gritty sound with this particular uh, beat that we've built today, but that is kind of the way that a lot of what I'm doing with the drum log kind of goes. The way that the filters respond, the way that the master effects, especially the boost master effect, which is my favourite, kind of responds. It does feel like it moves you towards those sort of dirtier kind of sounds. Um, Obviously, you can load any sample you want into the samples, but yeah, it, it kind of does have that character, and I and I like 
instruments with a particular character. I think that's a valuable thing. Um, most of the stuff that I particularly like has a a character to it, whether that's in the way that you perform it or it, with the sounds. The ethos behind the drum log definitely feels like it, it's designed to be a drum machine and not a, uh, a, a groove box of sorts, even though in this particular um, jam we kind of got um, some other aspects in there to make it kind of sound a bit more um, uh, sort of full track jammy kind of thing going on. Um, but some of the limitations around the way that you can play in notes, for example, or rather the fact that you can't really play in notes and you have to uh, motion sequence them. The limitations around the way that the samples um, uh, maximum decay means that we can't uh, sort of do sort of longer samples and loops. Um, this is not a box which, like um, if we compare uh, to the flexibility of say the, the dig attack or the syntax, you're not going to necessarily be creating whole drone pieces on the drum log, which is something I have done on those devices. I can conceive of ways that you could get interesting droning characteristics with the uh, resonating filters and the like, but it's kind of, it's a little bit more pared down in terms of um, the surface that you have to play with um, in terms of that side of pushing its boundaries. That's not a bad thing per se, because it leads to it being a more focused uh, device, but I think it's worth making that um, comparison. One thing I do really miss on the drum log when um, comparing it to something uh, like the uh, Digitact or the Syntact is an LFO uh, or a couple of LFOs. Um, a lot of times I kind of wanted to reach for an LFO to automatically sweep certain parameters, whether it's the decay or the tuning or the filter uh, or, or, or whatever, even the, the volume. And uh, personally, coming from that Electron world, I found that um, occasionally a little bit limiting. Of course, you can um, motion sequence those kind of LFO curves and perhaps that's more um, uh, the way you should approach it, especially given that you could um, essentially, if you were willing to motion sequence all the parameters you wanted to, um, be controlling many, many more parameters than would be possible on those electron boxes. So it's kind of limited in one way, but um, more flexible in another in, in that regard. But it was just something um, coming from that, that world of, of being an electron fanboy that, that I, I particularly noticed. Now that might feel like I'm saying that the drum log generally is less um, flexible or capable than, than my two beloved electrons, but there are some definite uh, advantages uh, that the drum log has uh, over those. Um, firstly, um, and I think um, the key thing here is that this has um, synthesis and samples in one box. That's a, 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 a big difference between the drum log and the electron boxes. Um, another massive difference, of course, is that we have the individual outs on the drum log, and although I wasn't using them in this uh, jam, um, you certainly can. I would also say that the side chaining on the drum log works better than the side chaining on the uh, dig attack uh, as well, if I'm being completely honest. Um, you also, of course, have a much wider range of uh, potential effects. Um, the dig attack and syntax delay and reverb are good sounding delays and reverbs, but you are stuck with those particular algorithms. Whereas on the drum log, even out of the box, you have multiple different uh, reverb types. We didn't really touch on them so, so much uh, in this jam, but we have like the, the uh, shimmer reverbs, we have the octave down reverbs and all that kind of thing. Um, and then you also have the multi-engine where you can load in many different types of oscillators and uh, sound design tools. Um, and hopefully, uh, as this is released into the wild, people will be building those oscillators, um, which kind of puts it in the same sort of ballpark as the Syntac with its machines, I guess. Um, although, of course, you can only have one of them loaded at a time on the drum log. I think fundamentally, though, uh, the drum log just sits in really well with the other log um, devices that Korg have brought out. Those devices have always been about um, fun and focus for me. Um, uh, the uh, Minilog remains one of my sort of favourite polysynths, despite its limitations and despite some people's qualms about its sound. It has a character. It's very focused to get to the results that you want. And um, and the drum log kind of 
maintains that way of working. There's a little bit of menu diving, um, uh, which um, can be occasionally a little bit distracting, but once you get into that workflow, like with most things, once you get into that workflow, um, it's pretty um, quick to move around. All in all, I've enjoyed my time with the drum log and I will, I think, continue to use it as an alternative uh, to my electron boxes um, when I need something that is uh, a little bit more focused or just with a bit more of the character that the drum log has. If I want that character, that kind of more sort of dirty, gritty character that it does so well, I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll reach for the drum log rather than trying to replicate that character on another device. Um, so yeah, um, it's not um, a flawless device as it stands, but with a few firmware updates and Cork have been um, good at supporting the log range and their uh, synths um, in general over the last couple of years, I think with a couple of firmware updates in the next sort of 12 months, I think the drum log could um, be even more interesting and, and become potentially quite a special device. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this dive into the drum log. Uh, if you did enjoy the video, found it interesting and useful, uh, then uh, as always, if you could leave a like and hit that subscribe button, that's always really, really appreciated. But otherwise, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.